Well, welcome to this BICL seminar on the European Representative Action Directive. Great pleasure to have uh, everyone with us for this uh, should be a really interesting seminar debate. Uh, after many years of discussion, the EU uh, Representative Action Directive was finally passed uh, just over a month ago, a couple of months ago um, in early December last year. And the aim of this seminar is to bring together a series of experts to review the features of that new instrument and to address the key issue about how it will affect the litigation landscape across Europe. Now, as many of you will know, uh, the European institutions' uh, interest in, uh, in this area is longstanding and um, work on European work on consumer address and group actions dates back to at least the 1980s. The first concrete result of that interest in group actions and consumer matters was the injunctions directive passed in, in the 1990s, 1998, which although it was solely a, a regulatory measure was actually quite a significant uh, measure, I think at the time, as the first piece of EU legislation covering in a general way, civil procedure law. Now, of course, damages, the damage register was not included in that directive. And so monetary redress started to surface, the issue of monetary redress started to surface periodically um, from then on, and particularly resurfaced in the, the debate resurfaced in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and um, it has been increasingly uh, recognized that whereas a lot of progress has been made at a European level in relation to the substantive measures of consumer law, then th those substantive measures needed to be supplemented by uh, a focus on enforcement and access to justice. So in 2013, the Commission finally, after a lot of uh, discussion, reports and uh, 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 on this thing, the Commission finally enacted a, a legal instrument on uh, specifically on collective address, which was the, the recommendation on collective address. And that set out a series of common non-binding principles for collective address in Europe. It's fair to say it was a bit of a damp squib, that, uh, that measure. Uh, and um, work on the current measure, the, the directive, can be traced back to the, that period after 2013, particularly in 2017, when the Commission announced a new deal of consumers, which is aimed at strengthening the enforcement of EU consumer law. It took a while, of course, to get the uh, Representative Actions Directive onto the statute books, but then as now has occurred, as of December last year, as I said, and the directive that provides for a collective address remedy for the protection of consumers to be brought by so-called qualified entities, as we will see analysed in a minute. That directive has potentially a very uh, broad um, uh, scope with covering the 59 instruments listed in the annex, which cover areas diverse areas, such as product liability, data protection, financial services, travel, tourism, and sectors such as chemicals, cosmetics, et cetera. Now, although, the, uh, although of course, the uh, instrument is not applicable in the UK, collective address is a hot topic at the moment in the UK, and so consideration will be given during this discussion, uh, the way in which there may be indirect influences of, of this legislation uh, and, and the developments in the UK. We have a lineup, sterling lineup of speakers to analyze this topic uh, for us. Um, and are very grateful for them uh, taking the time to, uh, uh, to help us understand this topic. Uh, we have uh, Matthew Felwick and Valerie Kenyon, for, who are both litigation and products liability partners at Hogan Lovells in London. We have um, Augusta. Masia Luvicu, who is a senior legal officer and team leader of redress and enforcement at Biuk. Augusta, I hope I pronounced my 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 phrase wasn't too bad. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, we have Neil Perslow, chief investment officer at Ethereum Capital Management Limited, 
and Ronson Salim, lecturer at Aston Law School and expert on uh, academic expert on collective redress. So um, the, the idea is what we try to do is um, pull together a consolidated presentation, looking at a series of different topics. And um, what we're going to do is we are going to, you um, know, in, in order to um, um, to look at the topic, we're going to start with an analysis of the scope of the directive and standing. Then we will go on to look at domestic versus cross-border forms of representative action, which will include the, um, the uh, opt-out, opt-in dimension. Then we'll tackle the types of remedy and procedure. Um, and um, finally, uh, look ahead at how this will work in practice and some predictions, how things will work as we go along. Um, there will be time for questions uh, um, and answers at the end. So please feel free to send us over your questions using the chat function, which I'm sure everyone now is all aware of. Uh, and you feel free to do that as we're going along. Uh, if questions occur to you, you want things to be addressed, and I will deal, try and deal with that as we're going along or group them all together at the end in a general discussion at the end. Um, so uh, without any further ado, um, I'm going to try and now launch the uh, PowerPoints and um, we will uh, then um, hand over, say that, here we go, start of the PowerPoints. Uh, now the PowerPoints are, are launched. Um, and I will hand over to the first speaker, who is Augusta, who's going to tell us about standing and scope. Over to you, Augusta. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, so indeed, uh, I think everybody will understand that, uh, you know, being from the European Consumer Organization, uh, the question of legal standing and who can bring those actions is very interesting and important to us. And uh, the directive is actually rather prescriptive of which bodies can be given legal standing um, uh, to bring those actions. Could you maybe go one slide back, Duncan? Uh, Yes, so here I think um, so that all the participants can see the criteria. Uh, so uh, those bodies that will be able to, um, to bring representative actions, they have to be designated as qualified entities by the member state where they are established. And um, it, it is either public bodies or non-for-profit organizations and such organizations uh, if they want to become qualified entities, they have to comply with certain criteria. So you can see the criteria on, on the screen. Um, and that in principle means that uh, say a group of consumers uh, cannot bring an action in, in court. They, they have to find an existing organization because an organization has to prove that it was already pre-existing to bringing the action. So you cannot establish the organization or at least in theory and then go, go to court. So there are all those uh, criteria and, uh, and those qualified entities uh, then will be able to bring actions. But there are several questions that are still open and we do not know what will happen. Um, next slide, please, Duncan. So first of all, um, these criteria are only uh, set up for qualified entities who will bring cross-border representative actions. And cross-border means in another country than they are established. For the domestic cases, um, the EU countries are free to set the criteria that they wish to set. So for the moment, we do not know what those criteria will be. And um, it could be pretty important because uh, at least until now, most of the representative actions in Europe were domestic actions, meaning that you know, the bodies established in that country would bring an action in that country, even if it is against a trader 
from, uh, from another country? So that is one important question. Another one is, will some countries only tend to designate public bodies? Because for instance, that is the case now in several existing collective redress procedures. Say Hungary, uh, only uh, the public authority can do collective redress. Also in Denmark and Finland, this right is reserved to the public consumer protection authorities, consumer ombudsmen, and they bring cases extremely rarely. What they say though, that this uh, power to do this helps them a lot in negotiations with the traders, you know, to, to fix the, uh, the alleged unfair practices also. So this is also an interesting thing. And it is related to the fact that indeed, as Duncan has said, the scope of the directive is very wide. So it could be even difficult to find enough of the qualified entities that could cover the whole scope. Of course, it's not only consumer organizations strictly, it could be passenger organizations, patient organizations. So, but. Anyway, uh, I think especially in smaller countries, it might be difficult to find uh, that big number of qualified entities. So that is one question. And of course, it will depend on all the setup of, of the collective uh, procedures that we don't know yet. The last question, I think uh, that is very interesting, but maybe other presenters will touch on it too. Will those qualified entities in practice be able to join and bring actions on behalf of the consumers from several countries? Because we have quite some examples of big, uh, let's say, mass harm situations that go beyond the limits even of several EU countries that cover all the EU. So will it be possible that all the consumers from different countries are represented in one country? I, I think it is a very big question because the rules and private international law are not regulated in, in this directive. And from what we see, uh, at least from the examples now, the judges are quite hesitant to apply uh, the law from another country. So if you have, you know, I don't know, a set of more than 20 applicable laws, I think uh, there is a high risk that a judge would dismiss this action um, at all. So I think that's the main points I wanted to say, but there might be comments from other colleagues. Thank you very much, Augusta, for that very, very informative overview. Neil, did you want to, to react from a, a funding perspective in relation to that? Sure, thank you, Duncan. Um, so from a, a funding point of view, there are some specific provisions um, in the directive which are all geared towards trying to protect against abuse of litigation and uh, abuse of the process. Um, so, for instance, there are some provisions on disclosure of funding sources for the qualified entities and provisions to prevent conflicts, um, and also provisions to avoid undue influence by the funder or other parties, um, especially over settlement of the cases. Um, th these aren't likely, I think, to prevent any form of, or present any form of barrier to um, funding of these cases. These sorts of concepts appear in funding practice all around the world. The conflict point, for instance, funders have to comply with conflict rules in Australia, um, provisions about controlling settlement um, and influencing the proceedings are very familiar to all the UK funders. So I don't see any of that as being in any way a challenge, um, but it is interesting to note that it's in there. Um, another interesting feature is this requirement that um, there is mandatory cost shifting um, so that a loser pays will, will have to apply. But the directive says that that is um, subject to, that's being in accordance with national law. And so that may well in practice provide quite a low barrier, a low hurdle um, for uh, qualified entities to get over and be quite easy for um, funders to cover off. I think at a more general level, um, I think it's quite welcome to see that the directives enabling claims to be brought by parties who aren't themselves claimants, so representative parties. I and mean, that's something we see obviously in other European mechanisms. Um, and in the UK, you see it in the CAT, but only in the CAT. And in the UK representative action, of course, the claimant has to be both suitable to be a representative, but also actually have a claim 
himself or herself. Um, and that means that when funders and lawyers are putting these cases together, they have to go out and find somebody who is both suitable and serendipitously actually happens to have a claim as well. And that perhaps is an unnecessary additional step to have. So this, this goes some way to solving that, which is, which is positive. I think there does remain to be seen how these criteria for um, uh, qualified entities will work um, on domestic cases, because obviously there's no guidance on that. So will those criteria be wide enough to be um, for qualified entities to be able to, to comply? Um, will there be enough interest in qualified entities in running these cases? And are there sufficient incentives on available for qualified entities to do that? So actually, will anyone want to actually play this role that the, the directive is contemplating? Now, of course, in the UK cases, we saw which run the football shirts case in a uh, effectively representative capacity. We've, we've got the Road Haulage Association in the competition appeal tribunal running the trucks, litiga uh, trucks cartel litigation. So there are examples of um, what might be qualified entities stepping up to the plate. But that this requirement for qualified entity may in fact be a bottleneck in, in people trying to start and bring these cases. I think another important limitation here is the fact that the directive only covers consumer cases and, um, um, and only the legislation set out in the annex. Now, again, that can be broadened and um, one would expect to see that over time, but query whether those, that list of legislation will adequately cover all the kind of cases that want, should be brought and all the causes of action that claimants will wish to bring. So for instance, you have secret regulations in that list, which were pleaded in many of the emissions cases, but there are plenty of other causes of action which were not, um, which would not fall under that secret regulation. Similarly, the consumers also have to be bringing claims in a, in a consumer capacity as well. So for instance, a purchaser of a mobile phone who happens to use it for business purposes may not be able to claim. So there, there may be some interesting uh, restrictions on the edges there as well. Thanks very much, Neil, for that reaction. Valerie? So jumping in, there's a couple of points that I would um, add, and I've put some sort of points on this slide, and I'm not going to speak to them in order at all. Um, what I would say first is that, um, call me a cynic, but I think that there will be enough qualified entities as long as um, consumer law continues to grow, as long as litigation funding um, is innovative in order to make it um, attractive and as long as the procedural rules vary between member states um, which means that forum shopping of course is a great possibility and we're going to be talking about that later on today so um, firstly I would say I suspect there will be enough um, qualified entities when you look at it across the board. Um, the second point I would add is that um, while there are clearly significant criteria for qualified entities to meet um, for cross-border um, representative actions and um, there's also an, a, a permission for a member state to create an ad hoc ad hoc ad hoc um, uh, entity which is appropriate in particular circumstances so I think that's also going to provide some much needed flexibility here from the perspective of consumers um, I'd like to focus a little bit about um, on undue influence and some of the obligations of these qualified entities. And this is where my points on this slide do become a bit more relevant. Um, number one, in order to be a qualified entity, there's really quite significant um, processes that you need to follow. There's um, information that you need to disclose. You need to disclose um, how you meet the criteria, certain information you need to provide on your website. There's certain information you need to um, disclose about the consumers you're seeking to attract um, and the um, success and otherwise that you've had um, in the representative actions that you've brought. Um, in addition, um, the entities effectively fall into the shoes of the consumer in, in some respects. So there are some obligations. For example, you have to have discussions with a trader um, in advance if you're, if you're looking for injunctive relief. And there's some similarities there, um, therefore, with the procedural rules in some member states requiring some sort of mediation first. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and then I think the other thing I wanted to bring up here, and I'm mindful of where we are on time, we have a lot of great content to get through, is a little bit of a comparison with what's going on in a number of member states and how this, um, these new requirements are going to compare. So um, what I would say is in France, for example, um, the requirements for qualified entities are currently narrower, so this legislation could broaden it out. Um, in the Netherlands, um, there are different requirements with respect to representative organisations, and so there's not a clear match there, and much remains to be seen as to how these systems are going to fit together.
Thank you very much for that perspective, uh, Valerie. On to the next topic, um, which is the difference between domestic stroke and uh, cross-border actions and the opt-out issue, opt-in, opt-out issue. And can I hand over to Ronson, who's going to take us through those issues? Thank you, Duncan. Um, in terms of domestic and cross-border, I think in this particular slide, I've emphasised some key particular provisions, particularly Article 6, and some of the relevant recitals relating to the referencing of domestic and cross-border. I think a good starting point would be Article 6.2, which, as you can see from the, the wording of it, leaves the coordination of claims actually to the proclivities of national law. And so in this particular um, context, there is quite a wide scope of, of national um, fragmentation and, and indeed fragmentation across the board in, in terms of the coordination of, of multiple qualified entities in a particular forum. In terms of categorization, um, I think the, the key point here is that the directive takes the approach of classifying whether something is domestic or cross-border representative action, depending upon the relationship between where the qualified entity is designated and, and as well as where the action is actually brought. So a cross-border representative action would, would occur where an a entity that is designated in another member state brings a particular, uh, brings an action in one particular or a, another member state where a qualified entity brings the represented action in the state in which it is designated, that is then classed as a domestic uh, representative action. In light of the recitals, particularly recital 21, what the directive seems to re-emphasize is that the existing rules of private international law that applies prior to the directive is equally applicable in this particular context. Um, and indeed, if, if you look at the wording at the at the end of recital 23, the emphasis that the member state in which the representative action is brought is the preeminent criterion or deciding criterion seems to re-emphasize the existing private international rules in, in relating to jurisdiction in particular. I think it, in addition to that, I'll just um, take possibly the fourth point I have slotted in, um, in this context. Um, with, re with regards to the existing private international rules, it seems to be the case that, again, there, the directive did not seize the opportunity to address questions such as jurisdiction, the, the, the issue relating to whether or not consumer organizations can adequately benefit from the jurisdictional privileges in some of section four of the, the Brussels one based regulation. And it, it seems to leave a lot of the, the, the implications of bringing the claim before the domicile of the defendant um, in play in relation to the operation of this particular directive. Um, so uh, there is room for improvement in, in the management of, of cases in, in regards to whether you, it's a domestic or cross-border consumer that you're dealing with. One interesting particular point is actually the wording of Article 6.3. Because Article 6.3, in terms of the designation of, the, of a qualified entity, makes it the case that member states offer mutual recognition to the designation of a qualified entity from another member state. Um, and the, the listing um, process, which is, which is um, stated in Article 6.3 there, um, seems to encourage that sort of mutual recognition. However, uh, a, a particular concern exists. Um, be, can, let's, let's stick with this particular slide. A particular concern exists in relation to, to Article 6.3. Um, and the, the, that concern is inherently into the last part of the, the, that particular article, where it says that even though you recognize the standing in, in the particular list of a designated entity, a court seized shall still have the right to examine whether the statutory purpose of the qualified entity justifies its taking action in a specific case. 
um, arguably that leaves a, a particular room for the court seized to question the ability of a, of a foreign designated qualified entity to in actually bring a claim in its courts. Uh, so a, a bit of concern there. And I think my last point in, in relation to cross-border um, and domestic is the, the nature of, of Article 15. Arguably, it, it seems to promote this uh, creation of very quick procedures across member states uh, and indeed the use of uh, test case proceedings or pilot proceedings in, 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 some, of, in some of the jurisdictions. Uh, that, that's it for domestic and cross-border. Um, shall, uh, if we then move on to remedies, um, I think that the, one of the key aspects is that you can see that qualified entities can bring both redress measures and injunctive measures. Indeed, recital 25 emphasizes that it is actually possible uh, for both redress and injunctive measures to be brought in a single representative action. But what we can find that, it, that is interesting is that in recital 36 um, of the directive, it actually says that qualified entities can bring representative action, um, but they should be seeking uh, measures which protect the interests of and on behalf of consumers affected by the infringement. So it, it is a, a sort of a, a restriction there in terms of the types of remedies and the purpose of the remedies being sought by the qualified entity. The inevitable question that there, therefore pops up is what happens where a consumer alleges that the remedies sought are not in their interests or not on their behalf. Um, if you cross reference the op, this sort of wording and the purposive test as I call it with article 6.3, could it be the case that when a court seized is looking at whether a qualified entity is justified to bring the particular claim, would that question of whether or not that entity is seeking remedies on behalf of the consumers or in the interest of the consumers come into play? So a, a question that, 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 is, uh, that is in the back of, of, of the mind. Um, when one looks at the nature of the remedies, you can see that injunctive remedies, arguably it's easier to, for these to be sought. Um, it's worth mentioning that the qualified entity doesn't have to demonstrate any actual loss or damage on, on behalf of individual consumers, nor any intentional negligence on behalf of the trader. This is reflected in, in Article 83. Uh, to this extent, whether or not it's an opt-in or opt-out mechanism, it, that does not play into the, the, the seeking of a, an injunctive remedy. Um, so it, it serves to give this preeminence to uh, to the acquisition of injunctive um, uh, remedies being sought. With regards to redress measures, um, uh, the directive states that it encompasses remedies such as compensation, repair, replacement, price reduction, contract termination, etc. Um, and what is interesting is particularly the, the, the implications of Article 9.4, which seems arguably to create a a restriction on consumers and, and whether or not they can subsequently bring claims or bring claims in a different member state uh, whilst pursuing an action. So arguably a, a, a less alibi pendants type room. Punitive damages are, as the, the recitals in the directive refer to, are to be avoided or not permitted. But it's interesting to note that punitive damages are not expressly referred to in the articles of the redress measures. Uh, two key points uh, as well in terms of remedies. Um, the directive also, when you look at Article 9.6 and the operation of articles for uh, recitals 49 and 50, seems to front load the quantification question in redress claims to that of the representative action. Um, 9.6 makes reference that uh, consumers um, should not should be able to seek a compensation without, to have, without having to start follow-on or follow-up proceedings. And recitals 49 and 50 make explicit reference to uh, courts in um, using their own method of quantification of harm, or indeed the definition of separate proceedings will cover um, proceedings by consumers subsequently to determine their individual damages. So it takes away that burden on individual consumers and puts it into the representative action 
itself. Uh, and the final point of remedies, and one that's particularly interesting, is that looking at the, the recitals and indeed the specific provision in Article 8, it seems to be the case that the directive evidence is a clear stare towards the use of ADR for the resolution of, of these types of claims. Um, Article 8.4, for example, it seems to impose impose an obligation on qualified entities to undertake pre-litigation steps, and it's referred to as consultation. Um, there is a timeline for the two week period. And it, it is also interesting that when one looks at recital 41, it, that relates to this point, it actually says that um, member states should be able to require that the prior consultation takes place jointly with an independent public body that they designate. So uh, as Augusta mentioned, the, some of these public bodies, um, such as ombuds, for example, may really come into, into strength in, in this particular regard. And so a, a, clear a clear stare towards what they call consultation, but one may conceptualize it as negotiation uh, and indeed possibly even mediation, uh, one can argue. Interestingly as well, recitals 53 and 54, um, also evidence that stare towards ADR. A clear stare that settlements are to be encouraged. In redress type claims, um, it, it is interesting that they're saying that the court or administrative authorities should be able to invite the trader and the qualified entity to enter into negotiations aimed at reaching settlement. Um, for us within England and Wales, the sort of the connection and interrelationship between the ADR and the court litigation process and CPR is, is something that we've gotten accustomed to. Um, arguably, there is still more room for, for greater use of ADR in the, in the litigation process. But for um, European member states and their um, judicial systems, uh, greater interaction between the formal and formal litigation or dispute resolution process is something that um, this particular directive seems to also encourage. In terms of opt-in, opt-out, um, it's interesting uh, uh, to see that in, in relation to um, opt-in um, matters, particularly as it concerns redress type remedies, in a domestic situation, it, it is the case that opt-in or opt-out uh, mechanism, it's, it's, um, it, the member state has a greater degree of flexibility there. In the, in the case where a consumer is a, a foreign consumer um, or a consumer from another member state, opt-in is the, the rule that needs to be followed. But interestingly, um, the key concern here is uh, the phrasing that is used in the directive in distinguishing between a domestic opt-in and a foreign opt-in, particularly it seems to be the case that an opt-in can be, can be expressed tacitly in a domestic case, but explicitly in a foreign case. Um, and so it, this raises particularly um, important questions about consent as to whether or not a, a domestic um, a consumer can tacitly uh, be deemed to have opted in, in, into proceedings. I think I will... Um, Leave it there if uh, I think my time has run out. Thanks, Ronson. Thanks very much for that. Um, Neil, did you want to react to what we've just heard? Thanks, Duncan. I think three points from me. Um, on the cross border side, um, I agree with Valerie's comment that I think this invites forum shopping and um, the potential to run these cross border cases. Um, but the overlay of the private international law to this will be really important to understand for people backing these cases to understand how it will play out. Um, particularly, for instance, where you have um, nationals from one member state opting into a case, and then somebody else tries to start an opt out case in that member state, um, and what the courts would do about that, for instance. So from the funders perspective, they will want to have, they want to maximize group size to minimize the cost of getting that group together. But they'll be very sensitive about the risk of being knocked out on jurisdiction or um, launching a case and being stayed for a long period of time. So I think some real strategic questions there for 
for funders and Kiwis to think about on the way in. Um, the second point is just about injunctions, um, and it almost goes without saying that from a funder's perspective, an injunction um, is not what's going to drive this, and damages here will be critical. Um, so I think there is a potentially actually a misalignment between qualified entities um, and obviously the purpose of achieving results for consumers um, and this drive for damages over, over injunctions, perhaps. And then just the third point would be on the opt-in versus opt-out. Um, I think it's worth noting that not all claims work on an opt-in basis. So particularly in consumer cases where you may have large numbers of consumers affected, but with very small individual cases, book building them into a group, getting them to explicitly opt in, may be well be prohibitive from a cost point of view. And so there, are, there may be some kind of cases which only work on an opt out. So it'll be interesting to see how member states implement um, the directive and how many actually allow an opt out mechanism. Um, and so therefore how often these, this uh, approach can be used. Thanks for those comments, uh, Neil. Uh, Matthew, did you want to interject? Yeah, um, this is more really a, a defendant's uh, perspective, um, because uh, as well as the, the remedies that, that have been mentioned, uh, another significant aspect uh, is uh, an obligation on losing defendants to inform consumers of settlements or final decisions uh, that provide for the redress, redress measures uh, discussed. So this could be uh, could extend as far as contacting consumers individually and could clearly have a very significant reputational impact uh, for the company. Um, it's been included as a deterrent to stop traders infringing in the first place, uh, but the reputational issues would inevitably begin before the court establishes whether the defendant is liable, given that qualified entities will also be required to publicise and inevitably will publicise the claim. Uh, there's a, a purported safeguard which requires unsuccessful qualified entities to inform consumers if a claim is rejected or, or, or dismissed and to bear the cost of, uh, cost of doing so, uh, but that could well be um, too little too late in many instances. So the publicity aspects that go hand in hand with the redress measures could be very powerful but, but possibly problematic as well. Thank you, Matthew. Maybe I could suggest we moved to the procedure now. Maybe Augusta, you could provide your comments, um, regroup them under uh, under the procedure. So if we move to um, procedure, which Valerie is going to walk us through, and then we'll have to see from Augusta more generally. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so let's wrap this up as disclosure, evidence um, and communication. And um, I'll leave you to read articles 15 and 18 and let's move on to the next slide, which is the sort of interesting discussion. So again, the first point to note in relation to procedure is that there's a great deal of flexibility that's been left to um, member states and effectively they need to apply their own procedural rules in many areas. So admissibility on evidence, on how you appeal, national laws will apply. Um, as long as those national laws don't hamper the whole point of the directive, which of course is to create an effective um, workable representative action system. Um, I think success here is really going to rest upon communication, so the success of this um, regime. And Matthew's already touched on two important aspects of communication. One of them is the trader needing to be able to communicate if they have um, a decision against them. And the second, of course, is qualified entities needing to be able to communicate that they're looking to get a group of consumers together, why, what they need to do. And one of the things that's relevant there is evidence. So qualified entities need to tell consumers what evidence they need to be um, maintaining so that they can benefit from either being part of the group um, or benefit from settlement injunction um, or any other sort of remedy. Moving on to disclosure and evidence um, directly, uh, it's very clear from the directive that evidence is essential. We all knew that. And there's a recognition that there's an imbalance often in claims between consumers and traders. And clearly often the traders hold a great deal of information. As a result of that, there's um, a setup in the directive wording which says that qualified entities effectively have a right to request of the court or the administrative authority um, for disclosure of evidence relevant to their claim. But again, that is according to the national laws that apply in that jurisdiction. And at the same time, so that we have equality, traders have the right to uh, make the same request. But there's a great deal of unknowns here because um, 
we would need to think about the um, various national procedural rules that apply. Um, clearly, there's going to be very different approaches across the member states. And it's really unclear how those different approaches are going to um, interact with the existing rules. Some member states may have very limited discovery, and so this article may do very little. Um, in other member states, you're, you're going to get a lot more. So I think, again, that's going to go back to forum shopping and making it more um, appetizing to bring claims in one um, member state than another. Um, finally, let's talk about decisions because there's also a link there to evidence. Um, the decision itself needs to be evidenced by the trader. It needs to be communicated by the qualified entity. Um, but also what I think is interesting here is that the final decision of a court or an administrative authority um, in one member state is um, evidence um, in a proceeding against the same trader for the same practice in another member state. And there's much that could be said about whether this um, article really achieves very much. It's difficult to see how um, that effect wouldn't have been achieved in most, if not all, member states already. Um, and it is only evidence. So I think that the final point I'll touch on is penalties. There are penalties in the directive for non-compliance um, and also penalties for non-disclosure. So I think it's quite interesting that the directive is trying to um, make, put evidence front and center but it is hampered in respect by member states' local procedural rules. And even when it comes to penalties, it's trying to say there's penalties for not complying, but how much um, teeth will that have? It, it's going to depend on the member states' local rules. So pausing there, Augusta, did you want to um, add any perspectives? Uh, yes, maybe two uh, quick points. Um, so uh, first of all, about the damages. Uh, that it's of course very important that member states allow all kinds of damages to be covered for the redress measures. Because for instance, in the currently uh, existing French collective redress procedure, they only allow material damages to be covered. And for instance, that has stopped several of our members, French consumer organizations in bringing uh, collective redress actions because they were not certain they have enough uh, evidence for the economic damages. They did have evidence for the moral damages, but as that is not covered in the French procedure. So just wanted to highlight this point. And on the binding nature of the, the decisions on the infringement, I think it is interesting to compare it with a previous directive from 2014 on the actions for damages uh, from the competition law infringements. It does not include collective redress, but it includes a lot of procedural rules, you know, if, uh, if the victims of the antitrust infringements uh, bring actions for damages. And the article there on binding nature of the decisions is much, much stronger because on the domestic level, uh, the previous final decision on the infringement is an irrefutable proof of the existence of the infringement. Whereas this one in, in the representative actions directive, well, what does it mean evidence? You know, it, it of course remains to be seen. So I think uh, that's what I wanted to, to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, Augusta, for, for, for those um, reactions. Um, we move then now to the last section on um, looking ahead. And um, I think Matthew is going to engage in a bit of crystal ball gazing for us. Well, um, certainly. <laughs> Certainly, we thought it would be interesting to to uh, to try and have a, a little look towards the future. Um, so, my Hogan Lovell's colleagues in our offices across Europe have, have obviously been monitoring reaction to the directive. So, so I we thought it'd be interesting if we started with me giving a bit of a flavour of how the directive has been received in some of the member states, and then we thought we'd actually put all the panelists in, on the spot, not just me, uh, and ask them to say a few words on. Uh, a perspective or a prediction for the future uh, about the impact the directive may have. Um, so looking at, at the reaction, as, as one would expect, uh, it's been 
quite mixed and varied across member states, largely driven by what collective action mechanisms each member state has in place already and how those differ from the directive. Uh, starting with, with France, uh, as Augusta mentioned, class actions of one sort or another have been available uh, in French procedure since, since about 2014. Uh, although attempts to introduce them have, has, has been considered a failure, certainly by uh, the French media at least, perhaps not defendants. Uh, I think only um, 21 actions have been launched in that time and a number of those were dismissed relatively early on on procedural grounds. So consequently public authorities and, and consumer associations have welcomed the directive and particularly the cross-border elements we've been discussing uh, and in fact some have said that it doesn't doesn't in fact go far enough uh, because the final version fell short of, of some of the original proposals. The view being that in the balance between consumer protection and the desire to avoid abuse, the, the new system, uh, abuse of the new system, the latter uh, won out. So uh, a bill has already been introduced in France looking to reform the, the French class action procedure and that expressly states that improvements should be um, made to take account of the EU directive. Um, there are many steps before that bill will become law and we've seen no indication of timeline but we think that is likely to become the implementing legislation in France. Um, turning to Italy, the directive should sit alongside a new class action procedure, which they were introducing, that's being introduced in Italy um, already. The, however, that new Italian procedure has been repeatedly delayed. Um, the current date it's due to come into enforce uh, is May this year, although the risk of further delays can't actually be excluded, I'm, I'm, I'm told. The, the process for implementing the directive is yet to start, so the timelines there are unclear. Uh, but again, there's been relatively broad support, support for, the, for the directive from consumer associations um, because it extends the areas in which collective actions can be, uh, can be brought, um, as we were discussing the scope earlier, earlier on. Um, it may be, that in fact, that when both systems are in force, the Italian procedure will be favoured by claimants because uh, it has a wider scope than the directive. It can be initiated by an individual as well as a non-profit organization or association. Uh, and it can also be used for in injunctions and damages. Uh, so while it's a, an opt-in mechanism, there is a window for claimants to join very late in the proceedings. In fact, even after they know the outcome of the claim. So it, it may be that that's preferred over, over what's subsequently introduced um, in line with the directive. Turning to the Netherlands, which as many people will know, is the, the trailblazer when it comes to collective actions in the EU. Um, uh, there are several mechanisms in place in the Netherlands already, uh, and in particular, a new collective action for damages came into force on the 1st of January 2020, which also introduced a representative procedure for claiming damages on an opt-out basis. Um, there are some important differences between the Dutch procedure and the directive. The scope of the Dutch mechanism is, is wider than, than the directive. Um, a represent uh, any representative body can, can initiate a, uh, a collective claim under the Dutch system so long as they meet the various uh, uh, certain criteria. And the Dutch mechanisms include specific requirements for the coordination of multiple actions in respect of the same event. Um, so uh, given there's been so much excitement around the Dutch procedure, and I understand about 18 have been launched in the last year, there hasn't really been much uh, attention paid to the directive as, as one, would, one would expect. And it doesn't seem that it's gonna um, change the landscape there at all really. Um, finally, looking to Germany, um, this could be where we, we, we see the biggest um, change. There's a representative regime was introduced in, in November 2018, uh, the Muster Feststellungsklager. Some, some colleagues advised me that I shouldn't attempt to say it, but I hopefully have, have, haven't uh, made too much of a bad job of it. Uh, so, but that the um, the MFKs, I'm going to call it from now on, can only be used for declarative ju judgments. So the fact that, that 
the directive can also be used for direct redress, including damages, uh, is likely to be a bit of a game changer in that respect. Um, it remains to be seen whether the MFK will continue to be used. Uh, there would still be a place for it, given again the scope is, is broader than the directive in that it can be used for any, any type of civil action. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the MFK has, has been relatively ineffective from a procedural point of view, given that the federal government envisaged about 450 being launched uh, per year, and in fact, only 15 uh, have made it past the first uh, admissibility test, and several of those got dis dismissed straight away. So uh, commentators are cautiously optimistic about the changes that the directive will bring and, um, and, and the impact it will have. Um, so that's you know, necessarily a, a whistle-stop tour of what's happening in, in those four member states. Um, we'll, we now thought we'd just have a, a, a quick um, uh, few words from each panellist on, on, on what might uh, the future hold. So my, my final thought is looking at things from a UK perspective, where the directive won't be implemented because we've now left the EU. Um, you know, we do have a representative action procedure already uh, where a claim can be brought by a, a single claimant uh, who has the same interest in the claim as, uh, as Neil was saying, um, saying earlier. And, and uh, as he referenced, it's, it's not really been used very much historically given the high bar in establishing this, this same interest. But there has been a resurgence recently um, as it's been used for data breach claims in particular. Um, and the Supreme Court in the UK will, or in England will be considering the use uh, of, that, of the representative action in that context uh, in April this year. But even so, um, the UK procedure is, um, is much more difficult to, to engage uh, than the directive. And so in the long, longer term, if the directive is seen to be a success, particularly if the Supreme Court in England uh, restricts the, the use of representative actions, even in data breach claims, um, the, one of the impact of the directive is that it could add to pressure for reform in the UK to a similar system being introduced here. Um, Augusta. Thank you. Uh, I will be a bit more positive, if, if you allow me, because uh, indeed, I mean, uh, prior to the, to the directive, there was still quite a high number of EU countries that did not have any kind of representative uh, actions for redress, I mean, procedure. All the countries had injunctions because of the directive of the uh, 98 indeed, but not uh, not actions for redress. So it, it was a big leap for the EU to already adopt this directive because it was debated for too long and there was a very big opposition even inside of the EU institutions. So of course it's not perfect. And of course there are many unknowns as we have discussed. Uh, but it's a first step, and then I always believe that when we already have this, I call it breakthrough, then, you know, every EU country will be able to build on it, depending on their experience and depending on the existing procedural law, and hopefully Im improve it. So um, I think the prospects are better than if no directive had been adopted. So <laughs> I, 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 see, um, I see a brighter future, let, let's say. Thank you. Neil, what are your, your thoughts for the future? Sure, so I think the first point to make is I don't think the impact of this will be quick. Um, the member states have got two years to implement another six months to bring this into effect and we're going to do a lot of other things in the meantime so we're not holding our breath about the new tool that we've got available um, I also think implementation here is going to be critical um, member states are likely to implement this in very different ways and I think it's going to be useful in some places and much less useful in others and bear in mind also that 
you need to think about the size of markets in some of the places as to whether or not cases running opt-in cases in some small jurisdictions may be as attractive as elsewhere. So, so there's some questions there. And, and I think, it, as you say, Matthew, I think the question about what this adds over existing mechanisms is also really key. We've got some relatively effective mechanisms now in some jurisdictions. Um, they're likely to be the ones, of course, that introduce this in a more progressive way. Whether it adds much to what we already have, I don't know. Again, that remains to be seen. But if, if that all sounds negative, I don't mean to be. Um, I mean, Europe is starting from a low base of um, in terms of class actions and collective redress compared to the US, of course, compared to Australia, which has had a very vibrant class action regime for 25 or more years. Um, and whereas Australia is perhaps attacking theirs at the moment, it's really good to see the European uh, Union and Europe moving more positively in this direction. Great. Uh, Ronson, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I agree with Augusta and Neil, it's a, a, a step in the right direction. But um, there is this lingering worry that the practicalities of, of, of implementing some of the objectives of the directive um, will undermine its true effectiveness. Um, I think it does continue with the, the existing fragmentation across the EU. Um, so overall, a, a good step, but could have done better, I think, in, in my assessment. You sound like many of my school teachers. Um, Valerie. Sure. So I'm going to respond to a sneaky question that Duncan has asked the panelists via the chat function. So he's asked us, given the broad scope of the industries and the topics um, relevant to the representative actions directive, um, where we think it is most likely to be used. And um, I would say, uh, you know, to quote lots of films, follow the money. So I think it's going to depend largely on funding. And so I think to, to refer back to what Neil was saying earlier, I think it's mostly going to be used um, in scenarios where it's not so much an injunction being sought, but we have sufficient funding as a result of the remedy being sought, some sort of financial remedy. And then taking it further, I would say, again, um, thinking about um, where you have large groups, a lot of appetite, a lot of interest, developing law and uncertainties, I would be thinking about clearly data breaches and hacking. I think that the use of um, this kind of um, redress for new technology related um, disputes is quite high. Um, I would also say um, that we're going to see a lot, if you if you look at what how much has been spent in relation to the financial services, and I know this is something Augusta might have a comment on as well, thinking of PPI claims, thinking of bank charges, test cases, I see quite a, a lot of interest potentially in that space. And then um, I do a great deal of work also helping companies manage their risks when they're launching new products on the market, as well as dealing with product liability and associated with disputes. And one of the things that we're talking about time and time again is um, warranty law and can a company have the same warranty around the world and can they um, change somebody's technology account from one account to something else and in the past we've always sort of said in the EU um, the appetite of the regulator is so-so but in the US in Australia there's much more appetite for the regulator you're much more um, likely to have class actions in the US for these kinds of things so I think it'll be in really interesting to see how um, consumer laws in relation to warranties and sale of goods type issues are impacted um, because you'll have lots of potentially affected claimants, but it's not quite as sexy as the uh, data breach, hacking, technologies, banking kind of sector. Um, Augusta, I don't know whether you wanted to add to that. No, I think you summarized perfectly. Thank you. There's, let, let me just interject because there was that, that wasn't my question actually by the way the Valerie that, oh. <laughs> that, was, that was Daniel Lucy of McCann Fitzgerald. I appreciate name. the question. <laughs> There's also Luke Harrison has asked quite an interesting question as well. What the panelists consider the key challenges are to administering large-scale collector address actions and whether technology could help with um, some of those practical challenges, and so what sort of technology would be required? I don't know, Augusta, Neil, maybe thought to that in terms of technological solutions that may be that, that may be useful for for assisting with these, and 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 particularly the consumer associations as well, Augusta, in terms of their you know making this 
um, um, th this uh, feasible for them as well, which we've, we've talked a lot about? I am afraid uh, I do not have interesting details because um, personally I'm not very advanced on the technologies. <laughs> so with my apologies. But I know that many of our members either already have or are developing legal tech tools uh, to collect consumers and uh, evidence and complaints. So definitely consumer associations are looking in, into that. And that is uh, for sure one of the big challenges. Another big challenge, or at least as notified by several of our members from the countries where there are already uh, collective redress procedures is informing consumers because that is extremely expensive. And it had happened in some countries that the courts prescribed the way to inform consumers that was not efficient. Uh, for instance, through the printed media uh, that nobody was reading. So then they had to actually double the effort because they had any way to, you know, to inform consumers through the printed media. But then of course they also went through all the other channels that they knew will be more effective. And that has uh, cost uh, really um, incredible amounts of, of money. So um, just to add to the, to the challenges. Thank you, August, for that. Um, uh, Professor Yannick Sankova uh, asked us, what about the potential overlap? For example, GDPR um, remedies and data protection being covered under the under the directive is that may that um may that cause issues in relation to data breaches or is there is an obvious choice to make there any any reactions to that well uh, in our interpretation i mean of, of the lawyers of of book um gdpr does not enable collective redress actions. So uh, that is why also it is in the annex of the representative actions directive. So that's how we read it. But maybe we need to discuss with Professor Tsankova. Yes, a couple, just a, a final question, um, which I, I then add. climate change litigation, is there any potential uh, there and what about what about more globally securities actions? Is there going to be any movement on the European front to allow for those facilitate those? Any any views at all on those final issues before we round up? Sure. So I'll jump in in relation to um, climate change litigation. So um, we're clearly expecting more and more regulation litigation in relation to climate change and a whole manner of environmental and sustainability aspects. And it seems to me that it would make um, a great deal of sense um, in those circumstances for um, this directive to be sought to be used um, to bring actions in that space. Um, I think it's interesting to see that Annex 1 is narrow. In, you know, it's, um, it's got a specific list of consumer laws to which it applies. And as Matthew touched on earlier, the law in Germany, for example, is much broader in relation to the laws that it applies. So look, sort of crystal ball gazing, I think it'll be interesting to see how well received the directive is, how well it's implemented, and then in due course, whether those Annex 1 laws are expanded and whether they're expanded to keep pace with the developing law regulation um, in relation to climate change and all of that that it covers. Um, in relation to just pick up on data breaches, cybersecurity um, and, and sort of the response that Augusta gave, um, I would confirm that I anticipate that this will be absolutely strengthening in the space of um, collective redress for data breach. Um, absolutely, that's what we're lining up and expecting to see. Um, and uh, it will be an area where this directive could be hugely relevant across a lot of member states. Thank you very much for that, Valerie. Well, we've overshot just by a mere four minutes. So I think we've done rather well. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. Um, stimulating discussion, really great to have so many different perspectives um, from different viewpoints. And of course, what's going to be interesting is to follow this in the future. So let, let's perhaps reconvene uh, in a few months uh, time 
and, and consider how things are developed. So thank you very much to all the speakers for taking time uh, to participate in this. Thanks also for all of you in great numbers for joining us for this. And um, having a good evening and look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you.